Hi, so welcome everyone to tonight's Yonville Town Council meeting for Tuesday, March 21st, 2017. We did just meet uh, prior to this as the Yonville Housing Authority and we will be having a couple items on our agenda as the Town Council uh, based on the actions of the Housing Authority. So uh, I will ask our Town Clerk now to call the roll, please. Council Member Durham? Here. Council Member Dorman? Here. Councilmember Moeller? Here. Vice Mayor Dorenbecker? Here. Mayor Dunbar? Here. And if I could ask our newly married, you, you had to know that I wasn't going to give it, uh, Councilmember <laughs> Jeff Durham, please to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I probably should have warned you about that, but <laughs> thank you. Next up is the adoption of tonight's agenda. I don't believe we have any changes or corrections, so is there a motion to adopt the agenda, please? I make a motion. A second. Okay, and we'll just wait for our vote cast. Okay, please cast your vote. I know it's for those of you that are not normally here. It's very dramatic. There it is. <laughs> that passes unanimous. We, so we have an agenda. No applause for that? Okay. Never mind. Okay. Yeah. Let's save the applause for the next few things that we have here, which is uh, some of the fun stuff for us. We are going to recognize some longtime employees. Um, I'd first like to invite Ed Decker to come up to the podium and join me, please. First of all, good evening, and good thank evening. you for all the years of service you've given the town of Yonville. Thank you. This is a proclamation, a cer certificate of appreciation in recognition of Ed Decker or, for over 13 years of service as a town of Yonville employee. It's an honor to celebrate over 13 years of dedicated and conscientious service by Ed Decker to the town of Yonville. Ed served the town between March of 2004 in February 2017 and has served the town well as a building attendant for the community center in the Parks and Recreation Department. So, thank you very much. I knew I was going to forget your other much more important. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say it's Yeah, it's your last chance. <laughs> My chance, Lisa. <laughs> I just wanted to say, in the 13 years I work here, everybody is just a fine person to work with. Steve, Sam. Lisa, everybody that I worked with were such fine people. And um, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> it was great. I enjoyed my job, had a good time, good people to work with. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joe Hennessy, could you please join me up at the podium? <coughs> I bet you know how this is going to go now. Huh? <laughs> this is a certificate of appreciation and recognition of Joe Hennessy for over 15 years of service as a Town of Yonville employee. It's an honor to celebrate over 15 years of dedicated and conscientious service by Joe Hennessy to the Town of Yonville. Joe served the town between July 2001 and February 2017 and has served the town well as a building attendant for the community center in the Parks and Recreation Department. So, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. With the bottle this time, okay. What do we do around here? Thank you very much. Thank you. If you'd like to 
to say anything? I'm not going to think about it. Make sure the world can watch you. Come on, back over here. Be on the microphone because we got the world watching on that mouth. camera up there. After five years in the Marine Corps, 20 years in the Marine Corps, it was really a bit. pleasure to work here. It was met a lot of nice people, worked with good people. Lisa was the best boss with very high standards, but a very kind and caring person. So, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you. It was really fun work. Thanks, Ed and Joe. I'd like to see all of our, our uh, staff here recognizing the work that they've done and the commitment they made to our community. So thanks to all of you for being here also. And I also want to recognize, I don't, I don't think I saw Mark Haugen come in tonight, but I do want to recognize uh, Mark for his service on the uh, Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. So I'll just read the cer certificate of appreciation for Mark, the town council and staff express a sincere thank you for Mark's contributions and service to the town of Yonville as a member of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission serving between March 2015 and January 2017. And we'll be getting this uh, certificate to Mark. So thanks to him and let's give him a round of applause as well. <laughs> Told you this is the fun stuff that we get to do. Next up, I believe we have uh, a proclamation recognizing March 21st, uh, 2017, as Arbor Day in the town of Yonville. So I think, Joe, you want to join me up at the podium to, sure. to receive this, and then you'll tell us a little bit about what we're going to be doing. Get your bottle of wine, Joe. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, Mark's bottle. Must be present to win. This is a proclamation for Arbor Day, March 21st, 2017. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. Whereas this holiday, called Arbor Day, was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. Whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. Whereas the state of California recognizes Arbor Day from March 7 through March 14, and whereas the town of Yonville takes great pride in the many trees that bring many benefits to our community, including our schools, parks, and neighborhoods, whereas the community continues to place great importance in the planting, care, and preservation of trees throughout the town of Yonville, whereas the town of Yonville will plant new trees this month, and you're going to tell us about that in just a moment. Therefore, be it resolved that I, John F. Dunbar, as mayor of the town of Yonville, do hereby proclaim March 21, 2017, as Arbor Day in the town of Yonville, and continue the celebration throughout the month of March with the planting of trees. Further, I urge all citizens to plant trees, to gladden the heart, and promote the well-being of this and future generations. So, on behalf of each of our citizens. Thank you very much, Mayor Dunbar, members of the council. Um, it, it's, a, it's a nice uh, honor and a, rec uh, a nice little recognition uh, for the town uh, to be considered Tree City and uh, for us to, uh, to have an Arbor Day celebration. But the celebration wouldn't be complete without uh, planting a tree. So tomorrow at 2 p.m. in Veteran Memorial Park, we will be planting four oak trees um, that have been grown from, uh, from an acorn uh, uh, collected here locally and grown by, uh, by one of our staff members. The tree be trees became uh, so large that they, he no longer could use them in his yard, so we gladly accepted them and we will be planting them uh, tomorrow with the help of the after school program and, and all of you and, and all of you who would like to come. Uh, we would love to have you there to help us uh, plant those four trees, so thank you very much. Thank you. And that will be happening rain or shine. Rain or shine. <laughs> Bring your mud boots. We do have one more uh, proclamation this evening. And I know that some of you in the audience I saw this morning down at the Napa County Board of Supervisors meeting. 
uh, where all five of the mayors from Napa County as well as uh, Supervisor Alfredo Pedroza as the chair of the Board of Supervisors presented a proclamation uh, to members of our community recognizing um, the importance of uh, immigrants in our county. So I'd like to go ahead and read uh, that proclamation uh, to all of you right now. This is a community statement on immigration, March 21st, 2017. Whereas the entire Napa County community, county, cities, and town, as well as our law enforcement agencies and business, nonprofit, and faith communities recognize the long and rich history of immigrants who have contributed, contributed to our local economy, they have become leaders in agriculture, tourism, education, business, healthcare, and other professions. And whereas our county is a diverse one with foreign born residents comprising over 23% of the county's total population. They annually account for over $1 billion of the region's gross domestic product. And whereas the building of a welcoming community is fundamental to a vibrant and inclusive Napa County. We want to assure immigrants, refugees, and other newcomers opportunities for empowerment, civic engagement, safety, and freedom from discrimination, oppression, and violence. Whereas it is important for our leadership to make a statement of support to the immigrant community and for our county to be a place of trust and safety for immigrants who live and work in our communities. Whereas a relationship of trust between Californians, California's immigrant residents and our local agencies, including law enforcement and schools, is essential to effective execution of basic local functions. Whereas ensuring the health, well-being, and civil rights of all people, regardless of their immigration status, through a dynamic and responsive process that respects the community's diversity, is a shared responsibility of Napa County leadership. Now therefore be it proclaimed that we aspire to be a model for inclusion and equity for all populations, including immigrants refugees and other newcomers and we are committed to supporting the ongoing inclusion and long-term economic and social integration of newcomers and to demonstrate values of unity and acceptance and I sign this representing the town of Yonville and all the other uh, mayors as I said and the Board of Supervisors uh, signed on this as well so uh, we feel that we needed to make a, a unified and, and loud statement about how we feel about all of our residents here in Napa County and so we were able to do that this morning to uh, an overflow crowd actually so that was really good to see so um, I thank my fellow council members for um, supporting the effort as well so and thank you all for accepting that message so now we're going to move ahead to our next item which is our public comment period for those of you that are not totally familiar with our operation, we have a chance to, for you to address the council on any item that's not on our agenda. For the later items that are agendized, we'll still have public uh, interaction, but this is a chance for you to offer up any thoughts or ideas that you might have. I know that we do have at least one uh, presentation as part of our public comment, so I would invite uh, Diane Shep to go ahead and and start that public comment if you're the first one to speak. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And if uh, so, I'll just remind because I know that some of you uh, don't frequent us here. We have a five minute limit to any uh, statement. We're not allowed to engage in a dialogue about it because it's not an agendized item. So we'll receive your your comments and, and hear them. We won't, we just won't be able to have a two-way dialogue about those so um, with that if you could also please just uh, identify yourself I know I'm <laughs> Gary we've been in many meetings together so uh, but if you could just uh, identify yourself for the record and then please share yes I had five minutes also <laughs>
Hold on just a sec, Gary. We want to make sure, that, again, that the world can hear. So we're going to just give you some new, fresh batteries. I know. We'll pause. the. We, we paused. <laughs> Michelle already paused the uh, – or actually, we started you late. So we're going to run us some time off the clock. video out on an mp4 format so somebody can go ahead and just copy it at home the board of supervisors doesn't do that by the way your timer's running again so yes. thank you <laughs> <laughs> th th thanks for the reminder <laughs> john Starts over. Um, yeah. so they're holding this retreat and um they held one already for themselves that was down at the uh, the Napa, uh, corporate park and then they have um, five other meetings that are going to be held at McPherson Elementary, American Canyon, Calistoga, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Yountville Elementary School. I'll leave one of these with you so that you can have it. And today, we talked about it and told them, you haven't advertised this. A lot of people don't know about it. And. Uh, we said, you need to put it on Facebook, you need to do a lot of things. And they said, well, wait a minute, we did put it on Facebook, but that's the only way that they've advertised it. So if you really want people to show up and stuff like this, you know, you're going to really have to do this advertising on their own. I don't know why the Board of Supervisors does this, but I think that they could really, this is one of the things that I think that they could really uh, improve. It, it's one of their weaknesses, is really working with the public. And I would say that that is something that has, has to be encouraged again. And I'll leave this with you. Is Actually, look. if you could go that way. Yep. Oh, okay. Joe will pass it on over. You can just copy it, you know. And um, another thing is, is that recent something happened up on uh, in Angwin. There's a, a, a vineyard up there that was developed by a, a fellow and a family named Bremer. All right. Um, this, this guy decided to construct a vineyard by putting up rock walls and then hauling in soil from the, uh, the river project. And so it was like taking all of the soil that had come down the mountain and stuff like this and gone into the river and put it back on the hill. Well, they didn't do a very good job of this. And we've been, let's say, encouraging uh, agencies to go and review this, and they've done it. And the State Water Resources Control Board has come out with, with a really heavy cease and desist order on this. And they completely altered a creek. They filled it with a rock. They made it go differently, stuff like this. This is what some farmers will do. And I encourage you to be very aware, especially in your watersheds and, and other places like this, that you be aware of what the farmers are doing because some of them don't have the, uh, the best interests of the land in, at stake and will do what they can to make money. And uh, it's something that I think that all municipalities who have a water source and a watershed need to, uh, to be very aware of. So thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Okay, Diane. I have one question. How do I, I know I've got um, Michelle, a I think Michelle's gonna, how do you wanna navigate? How do I navigate? tell you when to, you can, do you want us to do it or do you wanna do it? We have a clicker that you can do I manually. Can, well, I may forget to do it, but yeah. I'll just give you the high sign or something. Okay. Well, that was a perfect segue for me uh, to talk about your watershed, as a matter of fact. Could I just identify yourself? Yes. Thank you. I am Diane Shep. I am president of Protect Rural Napa, and we are a group of local citizens who primarily, although not all of us, live on Soda Canyon Road um, on the other side of the valley, and Soda Canyon Road ends in the Rector watershed, as a matter of fact. I have lived up there for over 33 years. Um, my associate, Dr. Manfrey, is also going to continue talking with me. I have handed out a white paper to you uh, to read in hard copy, and we have prepared this uh, PowerPoint for your pleasure and review. Um, and also for your information, because this uh, affects the Rector watershed, 
we have met with the people at the veterans home so they are aware of this also we know that you share that um, the rector watershed is the most developed of all watersheds in napa county there is very little room left in our watershed in your watershed left to develop either as wineries vineyards or as anything as a matter of fact um, on January 4th of this year, the, the Napa County Planning Commission ado adopted a negative declaration and approved a uh, permit or an application for the Mountain Peak Winery to construct a winery. Uh, and that winery, the location is right on the edge of the Rector um, Canyon there. Uh, we started this out with it can happen again because actually in the 1990s um, there was another person who was developing uh, vineyard land up there right on the edge of the canyon and the siltation from that in the year following with the rains went down into the canyon into the reservoir and then gunked up um, the reservoir itself and the filtration system so bad that it had to be shut down. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. Um, the problem is that this particular project uh, has been approved already by the Planning Commission. It will be going up for appeal in front of the Board of Supervisors on May 23rd and I wanted to make you aware of that. We will also remind you at the end, the last day for, for any comment on this particular project is, I believe, the 12th? Yes, May 12th. Um, the first, let's go to the next one, please. Uh, in that application that was made uh, to the Planning Commission, the um, staff, the county staff, this is how they filled it out. And if you'll notice where I've got the circle there and it's in yellow, uh, it asks if, if the watershed is, um, serves any municipality. And they, the county said no. I happened to point out to them in the last hearing that they had for this appeal, point blank, and several of us did, aren't, several of my neighbors are here, it is a watershed that serves the town of Yonville and the veterans home and it was they just did not pay attention to that so I think that's something that I really want to make you aware of um, that it, right from the beginning there was problems from this all right the next one please uh, the mountain peak winery itself the facts it's um, this is the watershed you'll see the reservoir there that dark kind of thing over on the left side yellow is where the Mountain Peak Winery proposed will be. Uh, it sits on a 41-acre parcel, and it's at 3265 Soda Canyon Road. That's six miles off the trail. Okay, next. And uh, you have one minute left. Okay. Well, uh, Amber's going to take up where I don't get through. Okay. That's um, what I anyway, they are going to be uh, digging caves underneath uh, the vineyard that is there. And those caves are 33,424 square feet of caves. It's the, essentially the size of a small Costco. Next. Also on this parcel, there are two blue streams, that one that runs uh, through it and one that is right on the border of it. And the spoils from digging the caves and moving the earth around to construct this winery actually um, will be in next. Uh, they will amount to 1,935,900 cubic feet of material. That, if you put it all together, and I might want to say at this point, they, their plans are to put it right next to those blue streams. Uh, if you want uh, an idea of how much that is, uh, take a football field, a professional football field. You go up three stories, that's uh, above the goalposts. That would fill that. That's how many spoils and earth is going to be moved and move right next to a blue stream that goes directly into the canyon and the reservoir. Next. And your time is up, actually. Okay. Time. So if Perfect. you want to hand off to your next. Perfect. For the next slide. Dr. Manfrey. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. 
nice to be here. My name is um, Dr. Amber Manfrey. I am a lifelong resident of the Rector Canyon watershed, or the Rector Creek watershed. And so where Diane left off here um, is pointing out that <coughs> the Mountain Peak Winery parcel and the place where they're proposing to do all this work is right on the edge of Rector Canyon. Rector Canyon is very steep and deep, and that means that particularly for things deposited right at the edge of it, but really anywhere in the watershed, when you have a major storm event like the ones we've been having this year, things move very rapidly through that canyon and then the first slow water they encounter is at the reservoir. And this is why you um, will have problems with sedimentation in this reservoir, and perhaps more than say in like Con Creek or something where um, you have a little bit of a lower gradient coming into it throughout the system. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. There's kind of a delta that's built up at the, um, at the upstream end of the reservoir where the main tributary comes in over the years. There was a lot of sediment after the 1981 fire in this watershed that um, showed up there. And then um, also with this uh, development in the in late 1990s that Diane mentioned. So let's move ahead. Next slide, thanks. So here's a look at, um, at the downstream end of the Mountain Peak Winery property where it crosses a shared private dirt road. And this is uh, January 8th of this year, which as you all know, we had some big storms this year. So this is a flood event washing um, through their property uh, and across the road. and heading straight down into the reservoir. After this, it's, um, this water's gonna go over a series of big drop-offs. There's a lot of waterfalls in the canyon and all, all that brown stuff you see in the water is fine sediment. That's gonna be, you know, that's probably mostly in the reservoir right now. Um, and I mean, I say that being really familiar with this system. Uh, and I think the other thing to, to note about this is that this isn't necessarily the, the quote unquote right color, the color of water that you would see in an undeveloped watershed. This is water that's already carrying elevated loads of sediment. And um, one of the main issues that I have with the proposal for this project is that, uh, and, and the way the county handled it, is that they did not consider cumulative impacts in this watershed at all. We could go ahead. Um, oh, this is kind of, hark I'll, I'll come back to that point, hearkening back to the, um, Diane's previous point that uh, the, the, the county has a history of um, perhaps irresponsibly stewarding the shared resource. And, uh, and this is something that could happen again with this project. So, um, so uh, 1,100 acres above Rector Dam cleared for vineyards by the late 1990s, powerful storms in 98. Um, and this caused uh, clogging of filters at the treatment facility at Rector Dam. And the system had to be shut off for several months in order to repair that. And the taxpayers paid for that. That's how that works, right? And I wouldn't expect it to work very differently if it were to happen again. So let's go forward again. Uh, and let's just go forward again. Um, here's, a here's a map showing the current extent of vineyards in the watershed. It's um, now a little over 1,500 uh, acres of vineyards and there's 200 more planned that will almost certainly be approved by the county. So this is not a watershed that's pristine by any measure, and um, to not consider cumulative impacts, especially with this much earth moving on a site, is, in my opinion, uh, an irresponsible kind of um, policy angle to be taking. So, um, I, you know, our question for you here today is, um, is the Rector water supply secure, and are the taxpayers, um, perhaps if not, are the taxpayers again have to, going to have to foot the bill for this bad planning uh, oversight that's going on at the county level? Let's go ahead. Um, so the current status of this project, the uh, Napa Planning Commission issued uh, a negative declaration of environmental impacts saying it'll have no significant impact. So therefore there's no secret requirements, no EIR proposed for this project. Um, concerned citizens are appealing the Napa County Board of Supervisors. And if I could just quickly get people who are here on this issue, to maybe stand up, just to give you an idea. That this is how many people are, you know, concerned enough. We have no real benefit other than perhaps our quality of life on this project. But we're here to tell you what we see going on in our neighborhood, you know, is, is connected to what happens to you in your water supply. And um, I would encourage you to look at the issue and protect yourselves and your own interests in this. So go ahead. Uh, right. And you um, do have one minute left. Okay. Last, last slide, I think. Um, so... Uh, as Diane mentioned, the last day to comment um, uh, publicly to submit correspondence on this is May 12th. Uh, on May 21st, we'll be having a community picnic to um, celebrate our community and organize. Um, and the site will be right next door to the Mountain Peak Winery project site. So if you're interested in actually seeing this on the ground, you're all invited to join us.
please come up, see your watershed, see what's going on up there, and meet your neighbors. Um, and uh, then on May 23rd, the Napa Board of Supervisors will be hearing our appeal. And that's something that um, the city of Yontville could potentially send a representative to. And what we would encourage would be to, first and foremost, request a full EIR for this project. I think it really um, has the qualifications where it would be um, the correct thing to do. And, um, you know, potentially, depending on your review of the project, request that it be denied. Um, so, uh, next slide. I think, I think that's you. the time. Thank you. Is there anyone else that has a public comment to address the council tonight? Okay, up front, and then we'll go in the back. If you could just lower that microphone a little bit for us, I please. I think so. Huh? Thank you. Is that better? That's better. Okay, great. My name is Barbara Goodja, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today regarding Mountain Peak Winery. I'm going to honor your time and my time and read my statement so I can get through it kind of quickly, so okay. don't mind that. Uh, my name is Barbara Goodja, and I recently built a home on Soda Canyon Road on property that has been in my family for almost 100 years. Soda Canyon has always had a special place in my heart, not just because of the family connection. It's a beautiful, remote, and peaceful place in the valley. The neighborhood is rural with a mixture of vineyards, homes, the creek, wineries, and lots of open space. The proposed Mountain Peak Winery with its tasting room and caves is the size of a shopping mall and will have significant impact not just on the Soda Canyon environment, but in the entire county and including Yachtville. The size and scope of the project is totally incongruent with the actual size of the parcel, and this commercial facility is much better suited for placement in an industrial area and not on a remote dead-end road. It screams of out-of-control plans for tourism and marketing and is in direct opposition to the law and spirit of the Ag Preserve. I'm here today with my neighbors to emphasize that this is not just a Soda Canyon problem. This is a Napa County problem. Besides the cumulative effects and the concerns of commercialization in the valley, the proposed Mountain Peak Winery is in the Rector Watershed, which is the most developed of all watersheds in Napa County, which was very clear with the slides. I would ask the Yountville City Council and the good people of Yountville to join us in resisting this inappropriately placed winery. Despite the over-the-top size and scope of the proposal, the County Planning Department and the County Planning Commission did not even see the need for an environmental impact report before it was approved. The cumulative effect of this rampant development threatens to turn our agricultural land into a wine industry, entertainment centers, and parking lots, not to mention the negative impact on the local environmental resources. Please join us in standing up for preserving the agricultural heritage of Napa Valley and insisting that common sense and scientific reasoning returns to land use planning in Napa Valley. And again, the hearing, the appeal will be on May 23rd, and we would appreciate that you stay informed, stay engaged, and we would certainly appreciate it if people would attend the hearing and learn more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Mr. Bartisano, I saw your hand up. about this but uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm representing uh, Yonfield Little League I'm one of the board members and uh, we just want to make an announcement April 1st is our opening day out here for uh, the Yonfield Little League 830 m pancake breakfast the Kiwanis uh, Club in Yonfield is going to sponsor that uh, 930 is a ceremony and then 945 is a first pitch for uh, our game out there and we are also having a fundraiser April 29th for the uh, Yonfield Little League it's going to be a dinner dance at the Yonfield Community Center uh, 5.30 to 10.30, there's going to be a live band, and uh, uh, I think we have about four chefs to prepare uh, some, hopefully, baseball-type food. So uh, Bonnie Bus has tickets, we have tickets, and we're also going to sell tickets out at the uh, concession stand. So come join us and uh, support the Yonkville Little League. Great. Thanks very much. Huh? Anyone else have a comment to uh, present to the council? Yes, please. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. If you could uh, raise that up a little sure. bit. I should have had Tom do that too. But. Uh, good evening, Mayor of Dunbar, Honorable Council uh, members. Thanks for this uh, opportunity to speak. My name is Glenn Schroeder. Um, I'm a fourth generation Napa. I live on the Minnesota Canyon Road. My dad taught in Napa High his entire career. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Is that not loud enough? If, is if that you better? Could just get a little closer, maybe just project a little Pretend bit. like I'm at a rock show and just exactly. kind of grab the mic. And, yeah. uh, uh, Glenn Schroeder, Soda Canyon resident, fourth generation Napa County resident. Uh, my dad taught at the local high school. He was a science teacher at Napa High his entire career. Um, I'm treasurer of the local soccer league. I'm the CFO of a company down in Napa called AUL Corp. Um, I'm here today to just uh, make note of the fact that our, our neighbors are here. I'm here to 
urge uh, the town council to educate yourselves on the issue that's going on in the Rector watershed. Uh, at first, it started out to be a personal matter. Then I started to realize there's a much bigger picture uh, here. And the bigger picture to me is that the concern I have in regard to this particular project and how it might affect your town's water supply is my understanding, which is limited, but I think functional, is that they're going to take a lot of cave tailings, a significant amount of cave tailings, build them up. They're eventually going to tear. The, so when they dig the cave, there's going to be an enormous amount of tailings sitting there. Uh, then eventually they're going to rip out all the vineyards, put the cave tailings down, and sort of cover that back over with the dirt and put the vines back in. It's an enormous amount of engineering work. Uh, I, I don't think that the county's really recognized it for the, for the threat that it might represent in, in light of what happened in the mid-90s, which I got to watch from um, across the valley. Uh, but it's definitely something I think you guys should have a look at, and I would encourage you guys to educate yourselves about it as much as possible. Great. That's Thank it. you very much. Help. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Anyone else? Good evening, Tom, Mayor Dunbar, um, members of the Town Council. Uh, my name is Captain David Hallett. I, I also live up on Soda Canyon. I looked around this evening. We almost outnumber the residents here. That's right. But um, I would say I've lived in Napa for 16 years. Uh, we, my wife and I, we come up regularly to you and Bill. You have a pristine town here. It's absolutely wonderful to come here and look at the way you keep your town. Uh, you look after your town, but you can't live in a bubble. You're surrounded by Napa County. The Napa County is run by five supervisors. Their supervisors appoint five commissioners. And in January, at the initial hearing, not one of those commissioners challenged the staff of Napa County when they said that Rexer Watershed does not feed a municipality. Not one of them. Why didn't they challenge it? Because they don't want to challenge it. They're in the business of approving vineyards and wineries. And if you get in their way, they will just trample all over you. Please look after yourselves. Your water quality is at risk. It was at risk in 98 when a huge vineyard up on the top of Rector Watershed polluted the reservoir and clogged the filters. I'm not sure how the residents of the county will feel if they're asked again in the future to put in new filters if they get clogged again. You might just, as residents of Yonville, find yourselves on the hook for the whole bill. I'm really not sure. Um, but I would be very, very cognizant of the risk that you own, that the, this development at Mountain Peak poses to your water. I moved here from Texas. And in Texas, I learned when you have acreage, if you don't have water, it's just dirt. That's what they told me when I went there. No water, it's just dirt. Your water comes from the Rector Watershed. You don't have good water, all this could go away. Not permanently, because you know they can all engineering, they can shut it down, you can buy water from uh, Napa City while they remodel the uh, filter system, pumps. But it will affect you. So please pay attention. And if you feel that you can spend the time, join us April 23rd, express your views to the supervisors. Let them know your feelings. Let them know you're watching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments for the council tonight? Yes. Good evening. My name is Julia Arger, and my family and I own uh, property directly across the road from the proposed Mountain Peak Winery. And we're very concerned for all the things that have been mentioned, but today I went down and looked at the Blue Creek that runs across the road or under the road 
directly um, at the end of our property and across from Mountain Peak property. And the water is raging. Uh, we have pictures from the recent flooding situation where uh, it's, it's completely, it's, it was probably this high across the road. It's muddy, it's dirty when this happens. Now, during the drought, you wouldn't know that there was much of a creek there, but this is a live blue line uh, creek. I want to say that with this proposal that Mountain Peak Vineyard is making, they are going to be moving around in their process of digging the caves and building underground moving they are going to be moving over one million square feet of dirt. One of the pilings is over three stories high. It's proposed to put that very near the Blue Line Creek. It makes no sense to do this and say that it's not going to have any environmental impact. That dirt sitting there, if we have situations like the weather we've had now, will go down that Blue Line Creek, the silt, the dirt, and it is going to end up in Rector Canyon, and it is going to impact your water supply here. So I add my voice to a grave concern about the impact of this oversized overreach outrageous proposal right here in in our uh, county so please again learn the facts and join us to oppose this uh, huge size and scope of this outrageous proposed winery project thank you thank you very much anyone else last chance okay seeing no one else coming forward we'll move on from public comment and thanks to all of you that shared your comments. I know that you may not want to stay for the entire meeting. We won't be offended. Uh, but if you are going to head out, maybe you could do that um, just kind of quietly as we continue to hold uh, the rest of our meeting. Um, so next up, we have a consent calendar that has uh, our minutes from three separate meetings. Is there any discussion or a motion to accept the consent calendar as presented? I move to accept the consent calendar as presented. Thank you. Anyone a more? second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. That's unanimously passed. Thank you very much. Next up, we have a presentation of the Napa County Mosquito Abatement District Annual Report. Gentlemen, welcome back. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, and staff. I'm Stephen Rosa. I have been the representative to the Napa County Mosquito Abatement District going on for 28 years now. Um, here with our annual report, I brought, uh, or actually Wes brought me, Wes, Wes Maffei, our general manager, and uh, great guy. Anyway, the, um, the board, we've been pretty active here lately. We're currently uh, reviewing our employee policy manual. We do that periodically, at least every couple of years. It's pretty important with uh, changes in laws, different things going on um, with, with employee law. For instance, uh, the uh, medical marijuana laws and where that's available, uh, electronic device policies that we're trying to develop. Uh, we're getting into email and so forth in our, in our district. So we're looking into that. We have a... Uh, a uh, ad hoc committee looking at that now we also have formed an ad, ad hoc committee uh, looking at our long-range financial planning uh, in regards a lot to retirement uh, you guys deal with it all the time here too uh, all the all the liabilities and the uh, long-term uh, obligation that that uh, that has raised its ugly head lately um, also we're gonna have a huge mosquito uh, problem this year we have water in places that there hasn't been water in probably 10 years, so uh, the crew is going to be busy with that. And having said that, I'm going to turn it over to Wes, and he can give you a lot of particulars about mosquito-borne diseases and uh, 
our efforts to uh, to combat. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a real quick overview again of the district. Napa County Mosquito Abatement District was formed in 1925 after a tremendous amount of debate by its citizens in the South County. Uh, and we've been managing mosquito populations ever since. In 2003, we had a benefit assessment, so that helped uh, the district to expand its services. We now do yellow jackets. We provide information on ticks and rodents and uh, help folks with any other questions they might have about insects and in, you know, vector-borne diseases and things like that. There's a little handout that you all have uh, at your station. Uh, there's a handout on yellow jackets. There's also a handout on uh, mosquitoes and a little flyer that came out a couple years back that just sort of gives you again what the district does, a little bit about its history. If you're a history buff, you'll go to our website, napamosquito.org, and there's a whole section on history, and it'll give you all the interesting early stories about how we employed convict labor to help us control mosquitoes. And, and uh, at the time, the district was run out of the manager's garage, and then during World War II, we didn't have any employees, so the manager's wife drove the vehicle to help him. Uh, so, I mean, it's just, it's a really colorful history, but that's, you know, what a small district is. Small in terms of staffing, we are the largest special district in Napa County. We cover the entire county. So that's almost all, what is it, 797 square miles. We have eight full-time staff, including myself. You have a manager, you have an administrative assistant, a scientist, and everybody else is out in the field, and part-time I'm out in the field helping as well. That said, there are a couple of little handouts, and then I'd like to just briefly address uh, an item of concern for us and sort of bring you up to speed on some of the issues associated with mosquito-borne disease. So you'll notice there's a nice big map of the state of California. This came right off of the California Department of Public Health Services website. It gives you a summary of what's happened with West Nile virus here in the state of California, which counties had human cases, which counties had West Nile virus activity, meaning we detected it either in mosquito populations or it was identified in dead birds such as crows and blue jays that were tested and found to be positive for West Nile virus. You'll notice Napa County had no human cases this year. In fact, since West Nile virus made its presence in California in 2003, we've had three human cases, two in Napa, one in Calistoga. Uh, so our caseload is really low, but there's still a fair amount of activity in terms of detecting virus in mosquito populations, detecting virus in dead birds, and we continue to do that surveillance. And our focus, of course, is to try and minimize the mosquitoes that carry these diseases. The mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus Besides the encephalitis mosquito, which breeds in just about every freshwater puddle in marsh, you also have the little house mosquito, little pinkish colored fella that uh, bites you at night while you're sleeping. That's the one that wakes you up, you hear it buzzing. It also carries West Nile virus. There's also another species of mosquito called the uh, foul water mosquito that is associated with wastewater treatment facilities, storm drains, and winery waste ponds. So, of course, we have a veritable plethora of winery waste ponds in this county, which means we have an abundance of this mosquito. So there's a lot of activity and time that we spend managing for these species to try and minimize the human-mosquito interaction that might otherwise result in potential West Nile virus cases. There's a second page to this handout in the back, and I won't bore you with the details of the chart, but it's very specific in terms of saying, okay, how many human cases, how many fatalities, how many positive dead birds, how many positive mosquito pools uh, since 2003 for the state of California. But then you'll look down below and you can see how Napa County compares to the state of California. You'll notice that overall, if you go to the far right for the 14 year total, the numbers are fairly low. I would not say that that's entirely because of the work of the district, but clearly we contribute to minimizing it. I think there are other environmental factors and things that are happening that also contribute. The unique nature of the valley, uh, I think, helps. But that said, I think mosquito suppression is still important. We also have an additional handout, and I want to talk to you a little bit about Zika virus. 
And as you are probably well aware, this was in the news a lot this last year and um, even towards the latter part of 2015. This also comes from the California Department of Public Health Services. It's their latest update in terms of the number of Zika virus cases that have been identified. These are human cases. They are not local transmission. That means these people traveled abroad, came back, got sick, determined it was Zika. You're looking at 524 cases in about 18 months, most of it in Southern California, but wait for it. If you look down the chart, you will see that Napa has had three cases. So clearly the opportunity for these things to be introduced, these diseases to come into our county um, is an issue. Do our local mosquitoes carry this disease? At this point, the answer is no. Where I'm concerned and what I'd like to draw your attention to is the mosquitoes that are known to carry this disease, the yellow fever mosquito and the Asian tiger mosquito, have become established in the state of California. It's now found in 12 counties and over 100 communities. And what that means is we have, this mosquito is now established. We have people that travel abroad, come back. They have dengue, they have, they have uh, Zika, uh, they have chikungunya. These are all diseases that are vectored by this mosquito. Our concern is these mosquitoes are associated with human habitations and they can breed in the smallest amount of water. We're talking a bottle cap and will produce these mosquitoes. A small bottle with just one ounce of water can produce these mosquitoes, so any kind of refuse. And in fact, I just came back from a conference in Southern California where mosquito officials from all over the world gathered, and one of the things they were talking about is they were finding these mosquitoes breeding in abandoned potato chip bags in the bushes. So it's a real issue. The little saucers in your pots, storm drains, water in the rain gutter, we are literally back to doing mosquito control the way it was done in 1900 when they were concerned with yellow fever. The issue is most of the activity for these species of mosquitoes where they've become established is Southern California, although we have seen it in Fresno and in Merced and it's starting to work its way north. We have a surveillance program in place. We're constantly looking for it. We want to get the word out. The, the important message is Eliminate the water sources, no matter how small it is, in and around your home. Get the word out to your neighbors. If you need some help, we'll come help you. Uh, we can provide advice. We can provide information. We don't, at this point, know that that mosquito is established here, but we're definitely looking for it. We know that San Mateo um, dealt with this mosquito. Last year was the first year that they did not find it but it was present in 2014 and 2015. They were doing yard-to-yard -yard searches. Um, they were doing fogging, trucks going up and down the streets, and we know how excited that's gonna get people. We're really not eager to do that. So we're saying, please manage the water. Ask us if you need help. We'll come out, we'll help you do the work. We'll help you look for it. And keep in mind, it does not take much. Even those little, um, I don't know what you call those yard drains that you see in the lawns, that folks are putting in so the drainage goes off into this drain and then it goes out into the gutter into the street. Usually there's a little bit of water that's held right in the bottom of that and these mosquitoes are breeding in that. These mosquitoes are breeding in the storm sewer systems as well. And Orange County has had a tremendous problem with this and they're having to take the lids off, get down in and fog. So it, they're, they're very adaptable to any place there's water. So it's not about alarming people, it's just getting the word out. We would really like to try and not allow that mosquito to become established here. We have enough of our own problems, we don't need another one. Um, with that, questions? Questions, yes, uh, Vice Mayor? Yes, I wanted to um, confirm with you what I believe to be true, which is that fountains and running water will not allow them to, um, to generate. Is that true? As long as the water's continually in motion. If you have any area that is still or relatively stagnant, it will still breed. So I've seen some of these really large fountains at the wineries and you know where the fountain comes out and it works, but if it's a really, really large pond at the base, sometimes right along the perimeter, you'll see a little bit of activity. Uh, if folks are, so let me back up. You brought up a good point. Rainwater barrels. Over the last few years, there's been a big push. Water recycling, 
capture the rainwater, store the rainwater. Back about 100 years ago, this was one of the biggest issues, and these mosquitoes moved right into the cisterns, the rainwater barrels, and the capture devices, because folks used to do just that. They would capture the rainwater and then use it. So these things are really important. If you're going to store water, make sure that it's tightly screened. If you have a fountain, keep it running, keep it clean. If you have a bird bath every week, completely change out the water. I realize that sometimes that might go against the idea of water conservation, but if that water stagnates, these things go egg to adult in a week. It does not take very long, especially in the summer, and they can move through very quickly. They're very persistent, day-biting mosquitoes. It's a little different than what we're used to. So we're talking broad daylight, these guys will come out and and they're hunting for you and they'll bite you through the jacket. They're really persistent. The other thing is the yellow fever mosquito, behaviorally, it likes to hang low to the ground and so they, they like to call them ankle biters because one of the things that'll happen is you'll see all these bites around the lower part of the exposed legs. <laughs> so again, it's, there's some unique behavior, but the idea is it's day biting and they're looking for any water source that's stagnant, especially in and around a home. They're highly adapted to living with humans. I have one more question, sure. please. Do they also, um, do they bite all mammals or just humans? They will bite other mammals. So it's not restricted just to humans. And do we know of the consequences of that for our pets? For I example? have not heard of any um, disease issues with the exception of I am aware that the yellow fever cycle because um, yellow fever is actually, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, say, from the tropics, especially Africa. There is a cycle that is, um, uh, happens with monkeys. And then what happens is humans come into the forest, they clear the forest, they're doing whatever they're doing. The mosquitoes will bite the monkeys, they bite the people. And so what happens is you get a cycle oh. between the two. Um, but no, I'm not aware of any other uh, diseases associated with you know, birds or mammals. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Right. We can win. Yeah, you sufficiently well, we're, caused we're, water, no nothing. The focus is, if we think if we get the word out, we can minimize the use of pesticides, and that's really what we're about. You know, we want to do this without having to, uh, as one of my environmental friends says, go nuclear. <laughs> so <laughs> we want to try and minimize that. We do have a bacteria, we do have an insect growth hormone that is specific to mosquitoes, so it will not hurt the birds and the frogs and pets and, um, dare I say, kids that like to get into the puddles. That said, once the adults come out, it's a different ball game. And so we really, one, want to minimize the risk of them becoming established, and two, minimize having to use pesticides if we can, and you do that by managing the water. Thank you. Thank you for you, your time. As you do every year, have caused us <laughs> sleepless nights going forward. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that, Steve. Thank you very much. No, really, thank you very much for educating us on this. Okay, next up, we have no public hearings this evening, so we'll move on to our administrative regular items. The first one, affordable housing local preference policy. And just to uh, reiterate, we did meet as the Yountville Housing Authority prior to this meeting, and there were some uh, amendments made to this policy, and, and uh, we'll hear about that as we uh, receive the staff report. Good evening. Tonight you have before you um, a resolution amending the town's affordable housing local preference policy and the policy expands upon the preference policies that were included in the original 05 policy by giving greater preference to workforce housing and creating a new uh, number first priority for eligible households with a member who is an employee of the town and or is required for emergency response the other categories build upon um, households where a member works or lives in the town or works and lives in the county and um, as Mayor Dunbar mentioned this was presented earlier tonight to the Yountville Housing Authority and they had recommended on a 4-0 vote that the council consider approval um, and discuss the item with one modification and that modification is to policy um, section 1a under the preference uh, and I'm sorry under um, under uh, number two for the employment and that is the the first item that an applicant will be determined to be an employee of the town of Yonkville if at least one member of the applicant's household is currently employed 
30 hours or greater for a period of six months or greater in order to um, put greater preference on a um, more full-term, longer period employee than part-time. And so we are presenting that to you for approval tonight. Thank you. And we did already uh, have a fairly detailed discussion about this item. We may have additional discussion, but uh, we may not need that. So any other questions of the, the staff report from Council? Any member of the public like to comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and I'll e either entertain a motion um, on this item or if, is there further discussion? Could I make one comment that is a, a new comment from the Yachtville Housing Authority meeting? And that is, as I continue to think about this and the relatively small inventory of affordable housing that we have in town, um, trying to balance that with the fact that we do have a lean staff and we do need them or would like to be able to call on them in the uh, time of emergency is there a way to structure it so that the first priority which used to be live and work in Yauntville so so that the first priority becomes rather than a town employee or an emergency responder becomes a 50-50 split between the two proposed categories one and two which is town employee emergency responder and category number two works in town because I think we have a, a large pool of people who work in town other than our town employees and we are cutting them out not for bad reasons but we are cutting them out of being number one in the lottery so I just put that out for perhaps further discussion if Gary, do you want to explain why the language is what it is? Um, it has been set up this way uh, based on the direction that was given from the council at the January 17th meeting. And I think the discussion at that time for those who were there was to give priority in this order, which is why staff has presented it as such. That being said, the priorities can be changed um, at the direction of the council. Part of the dialogue from our housing authority meeting earlier was that town employees almost all of them act in a an emergency response capacity and so that was also being recognized with this higher priority we've certainly seen it uh, as town manager stated this winter with the many nights weekends of uh, support that we receive from our staff uh, not just public works but uh, many of them you know, so it makes sense when you're asking an employee to drive an hour from home on a weekend, a stormy night, or whatever it might be, um, if there's an opportunity to allow housing opportunities for those folks as a priority, I think it makes sense. But uh, any further thought about? Well, can you, I'm sorry, can you clarify for me what you were saying again, uh, council member? Yes, um, I think we have a very my perception is we have a very limited inventory of affordable housing and perhaps by making a first tier limited only to employees of the town or first responders we would cut out a number of people who work in the town and have worked in the town for a long time and would have a family to bring into the town if affordable housing were available so I'm asking is there a way to combine the first two proposed categories to say 50 percent will go to town employees or first responders and 50 percent are people who work in the town let me try and explain how the process works um, what this does is it, it basically establishes tickets and how many tickets you get based on the category and they all go into a lottery so in this particular case we would provide notice that there is an uh, opportunity to apply for uh, encourage pre-screening with Napa Valley um, <clears throat> and then a person based on their priority would be given six tickets or I mean excuse me um, four tickets down so any person you know one person that just meets the income eligibility in theory can have their their name pulled from the lottery so it does not um, the a b c d e just determines how many tickets you get for the lottery um, if that answers your question so somebody 
<coughs> uh, second priority for people who are working in Yountville, um, just a regular business, they're going to still be given quite a few more entry opportunities as you go down. So I just want to make sure that it's, it's weighted, but <coughs> um, that's how it works. So anybody in any one of those categories could be the one that ends up um, winning the lottery. And typically we do like a two-week announcement period, applications, and then a drawing at the council meeting. Thank you. That is very helpful because from the actual policy itself, I did not understand the way to ticket. My sensing was that that might be <laughs> a little clarification Thank as you. to how it works. Any other questions or questions of the staff report? Any member of the public like to address the council on this item? No? Uh, any further discussion or is there a motion to be had on the uh, <coughs> modified uh, policy as presented? I'll make a motion that we adopt resolution number 17-3393, amending the town's affordable housing local preference policy. Second. As oh, as, 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 amended. as amended. Thank you. So we have motion and a second. Please uh, cast your vote. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. So the next related item is the status of our affordable housing unit at 27 Landy Way. Yes, Mayor and Council Members. Um, similarly to the item before you, the Yachtville Housing Authority has recommended that the Council um, approve a, a resolution authorizing the Town Manager to execute agreements for the sale of 27 Landy Way. By way of background, the Town exercised its option to purchase this affordable unit last fall escrow was opened and closed on January 5th the town is now the owner at the meeting on January 17th we received direction from the council um, to negotiate a purchase and sale agreement with Napa Valley Community Housing on certain terms and those terms include a basic sale price of 296,300 deed restrictions to ensure that it's leased to eligible income households an option to purchase the property back if Napa Valley Community Housing chooses not to lease it to eligible households or no longer wants to be in the business of leasing the property. So the town would have the option of repurchasing this again in the future to uh, continue its status as an affordable unit. And then finally, a loan of 60000 towards a down payment for Napa Valley Community Housing um, that is secured by a deed of trust and a promissory note. So the resolution authorize the town manager to execute four separate agreements that are included as exhibits. Those include the basic purchase and sale agreement of the property. As I mentioned, the deed of trust and the promissory note um, securing that loan. And then also a lease restriction and option to purchase agreement, which ensures that the property is deed restricted and available only to eligible income households for a period of 50 years with the option of the town to purchase it back in the event that it is no longer used for that purpose. And just to add, uh, part of the dialogue with the uh, Housing Authority was that that is a, an extended length of time over what has been happening, which was a negotiated term that is beneficial to the town because it, it, it ensures that this stays in this category for an additional 20 years, basically. Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's more typical for it to be around 30 years with certain things that would re-trigger it. And in this case, it's, a, it's 50 and the, the sale price is virtually within a few dollars of the uh, original purchasing price. That's correct. So what the town purchased it for and is selling it for is very close. Any questions from council? Since we asked all, most of them already. Vice Mayor, do you have any questions? Yes, please. So I was under the impression when we first talked about this that, um, that the uh, deed restriction uh, on 27 Landy Way uh, since we purchased the house and the, the Napa housing um, community housing is going to purchase it from us that the deed recept the deed restriction was going to be in perpetuity is that not the case so having a deed restriction in perpetuity and there's a real property principle called the rule against perpetuities and essentially restricts um, any restriction on a piece of land that goes on forever and so to avoid that having some time limit in place prevents that um, I see. hopefully that answers your question but I see. so then if after 50 years the town 
had to purchase that piece of property back, mm -hmm. then they could once again put the deed restriction into place. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And that question did come up in the Housing Authority, and that was, he gave the exact same answer. Well, that's mm -hmm. a good part, a good thing. One thing. One thing. Yes. Sorry. Good thing. I, I just want to make a comment. Um, so many people have approached me lately, uh, given what's going on in other parts of the town and wanting to know um, what the town is doing for its citizens. And I want to be absolutely clear that it's things like this that they need to know about. It's the fact that the town is purchasing a property in this community to ensure that it stays low income, to bring people into this community um, who work here, who can go to school here, and who will live here, and who will participate here. And unfortunately, a lot of the other conversation in get town on next door yonville and other points get uh, overshadowed um for things like this that the town do so i just i'm giving a shout out to the town that these are the things that we're doing moving forward that we have control over and we're making sure that these things happen so thank you thank you very much Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Kathleen Dreesen, the executive yes. director of Napa Valley Community Housing and an active housing partner with the town of Yountville is here in the audience representing Napa Valley Community Housing. So I no longer have to introduce Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, please, would you come share some of your comments? Well, as some of you know, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary <laughs> in the county, and we've had a long history of working with the town of Yauntville, and we salute their vision in providing affordable housing for low-income people. So if there's any questions, I just spoke to Deputy Sheriff Hallman, and he came up to congratulate us for our management of the properties here in town, and uh, he's very pleased with how we do it. We're very strict with our residents, but we want them to have a safe, happy, attractive decent environment in which to live thank you very much do we have any questions i do uh, yes I, do. I know we i asked this before but i was hoping you could reiterate um our relationship that we have with you already in this community with the different uh homes yes here. we're the owners of, of royal grande on Fennell road uh yaunt apartments on yaunt street and the mount uh, mount avenue cottages on mount avenue thank you very much excellent thank, thank you, you. Any other members of the public like to comment? I know we're getting close, getting close. The next item is why most of you are here. Uh, seeing no other uh, public participation, I invite to either further discussion or a motion offered by council. And again, uh, just to reiterate, we did have a conversation about this earlier tonight as the Yonville Housing Authority. Is there a motion to be offered? Um, I move adoption of resolution number 17-3395, approving and authorizing the town manager to execute agreements related to the sale of the real property located at 27 Landy Way in Yachtville, California. Did I see this? I second. Yeah, the vice mayor did second that. Please cast your vote. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. And Kathleen, thank you again and your entire team that helps continue to keep, as uh, Councilmember Durham mentioned, keeping the uh, affordability uh, also just a really well-integrated part of our community. Thanks. Okay, here we go. Yonville Cemetery Association, it's, it's your turn. Let's go ahead and start with uh, a staff report, please. Thank you, Mayor Council. Um, <clears throat> the town has received a written request from the Yountville Cemetery Association thanking the town for its past support for the cemetery and seeking financial support towards its newly proposed $75,000 uh, fence replacement project. The association is proposing replacing the aging chain link fence, which I think is older than the Napa Valley Community Housing just told us. They were 40, I think. So. Um, the project along approximately 335 feet along Jackson Street, which is also they have a driveway on the north side, excuse me, yeah, the north side of the fence, and then the town parking lot and the street uh, is on the south side. Um, the fence is located adjacent, as we said, on Jackson Street and to the town owned Yountville Community Park. The association has identified a cost of the project of approximately 75000 there's a request letter, but in conversations with Ms. Elicero, she's suggesting that perhaps we could just make it 32,500 each. I'm sure she'll clarify that 
when she comes up so that it would be 50-50 and the um, fence maker has agreed to donate or reduce the cost by 10,000. Um, <clears> in some ways this is an area that I think it meets a number of community objectives. We've talked about how to invest in our historical assets and certainly Yountville Pioneer Cemetery is at the heart of the history and part of the connection. Um, it's also a beautification project in an area in the north end of town. Um, and then I've also identified that in this particular case, um, since we had put 30000 in the budget for another fence project, but one of the alternatives the Park and Rec Advisory Commission came up with was no fence, is actually fortuitous timing should the council. So what we're asking for from a staff perspective is direction from the council. And based on that direction, if you wanted to proceed with funding, we would bring back a resolution at your next council meeting. And with that, I know we have a, a large number of representatives from the Cemetery Association Board and Board Secretary Liz Acero is here. And just before you get started, I want to recognize that we had, uh, we received three emails from local residents all in support of the project, uh, two of them asking if there was an opportunity to add trees along the new fence. I don't know if that's something that you have just considered, want to consider during your presentation tonight. Just, I'm just saying that those were ideas that they, they provided. So with that, uh, Liz, Lee, please. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Vandeleur Alessio, also known as Liz Alessio, and um, very proud uh, daughter of our president of the Cemetery Association of over 50 years, Lee Hart. And I'm also here um, as the secretary um, for the Cemetery Association for the last three years. Um, I submitted a letter for a request in February. It's a, it's a vision that uh, we've discussed in the um, on the board of the Cemetery Association. Um, as the letter describes, last year we were faced with uh, 13 failing and dangerous trees. Um, and unfortunately, there were several uh, large valley oaks that had to come down. Um, and we went through the process and you um, approved that. And then we also replaced those with trees. Um, in addition, because of the trees and the rooting and the, the drought, uh, the road through the cemetery was buckled and it was actually a tripping hazard. Also, we wanted, we needed to address that. So we went through um, and um, spent a lot of money between those two projects to beautification for sure, but really more safety for those, uh, for the many that do visit our um, historic Pioneer Cemetery. Now we're looking at the, the fence. It's not hazardous, maybe to the eye to some, um, but it's, you know, it's held up really well over the last 50 years, and, and I need to give Lee credit for that. It was back in uh, 1967, so we're celebrating a, a fence anniversary. Uh, 1967, I believe, that that fence was put up, and that was, that was um, hard effort. Can I say I was two years old? Um, that, was, um, that was, I'm sure that was really hard for um, Lee to get the support to put up that fence because not only did he put up the fence to the, the section, the 335 feet that we're talking about replacing with a wrought iron fence, decorative fence, but he, he um, pretty much covered the whole parameter of the cemetery. And again, it's to preserve the cemetery, to preserve our history. And, um, and it's done a beautiful job um, in that way. We're, Yonfa's a little bit different town now since 1967, and, um, and it's a beautiful town. We have people from all over that come to visit Yonville, and I know that my dad and folks who are from this community have a lot of pride in the town, and I want them to have that same pride in every aspect of our cemetery. We are an association that's all volunteers, um, you know, since it started in, gosh, 1890s, I think 1892. Um, it's, it's always been led and maintained by volunteers. Um, it's an association that, you know, once a year, Lee, our president, will send out just a, a reminder that we're having our annual Memorial Day uh, service. And will you attend and maybe consider donating towards the maintenance of the cemetery? 
we don't, you know, we, we want to make it easy for everybody um, to enjoy the cemetery. So there's really, um, and I say that because our pockets don't go very deep. And we, we did use a lot of our emergency funds um, last year to take care of some, some things that needed to be addressed. And this is why we um, are approaching you. I feel like it's such a great opportunity to work with the town of Yauntville and, um, and do something that just brings a little bit more pride to our community, to those who are at rest in the cemetery that goes back to 1848. George Yaunt is there. Oh my gosh, the number of people and the history in that cemetery, it's remarkable. Um, and, um, and for all those who visit their families, for those who are to come to lay rest there and who visit there, and our visitors who come to play, bring their kids to the park and glance over and see the cemetery. You know, I want it to be something that's, that we can all just hold with a lot of pride. The chain link fence has held up, and it can hold up longer. But wouldn't it be nice to, to make that, that area, that space, not only just sa not only safe, but really match the treasure that I've, I feel the cemetery um, carries for this community and for this county, for that matter. So I'd like to leave it with that. And um, I'll let uh, Lee um, talk. Good evening. I've got a little plugged ear situation. I don't know whether I'm talking or not. <laughs> uh, it's been a, a long road for me and for a lot of other people that have been members of the cemetery board since uh, 1967. And there's been many times when we've had zero funds to uh, work with. Uh, to give you an idea about how things change, way back in the 60s, we had weed spray. We took weed spray up to kill the weeds and the poison oak and what have you, blackberries, in the cemetery. And it was petroleum used crankcase oil <laughs> that we sprayed around. If you can imagine doing that every year. We went down to the the petroleum supplier down on Sauskal Avenue, Mr. Brishani, and uh, got five gallon cans of motor oil to spray on the weeds. And uh, there are a lot of other ex examples like that too, but things do change. We uh, have been lucky lately in that uh, in past years, for example, we maintain the cemetery on four thousand dollars a year, and uh, that's pretty skimpy. We uh, have been fortunate in that uh, we've had some volunteers that have come to the cemetery to help with the cleanup and uh, pruning the trees and so forth. And uh, Mr. Ed O'Neill and Ernie Osley, sitting here, are our chief work crew right now for free to clean the cemetery. Consequently, we have a little money saved in the treasury. And uh, we've been very frugal for the last 50 or 60 years and continue to be frugal and don't waste uh, money. And like Liz said, last year we spent $70,000. This was most of what we had saved up to resurface the road in the cemetery. So uh, your interest in the cemetery is uh, extremely rewarding. Uh, we're, we're kind of in a quiet spot there and we don't always hear from people. Yeah. We have had uh, one local group uh, send me a letter this last year uh, to thanks for the uh, improvements in the cemetery and with along with a check for $1,600. But uh, 
the, uh, the chain link chain. Our problem is, is the chain link fence isn't broken. It probably passed its prime, uh, but it's it's not broken. So we have a little bit of a hard time uh, drawing funds forward uh, to pay for that. So this uh, interest you have in the thirty so on thousand dollars <coughs> is greatly appreciated by the cemetery and the cemetery board. As far as trees go, last year, along with replacing uh, the road, we uh, had to replace a, a large number of trees, uh, which we had replanted. And we have valley oaks, and we have other trees, that are, uh, crepe myrtles, so forth. And uh, so we're always in favor of trees particularly on Armour Day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Mr. O'Neill is uh, our tree guy, and uh, he pushes, pushes for trees, which is great. We love, love the trees. So at any rate, we're currently in a planning stage for this fence to, to determine the viability of that project and the necessity for the project. And uh, so the, uh, the board will be having meetings to uh, discuss the issues involved and uh, including uh, locations for more trees, if you have any questions. Council, have any questions? Vice Mayor. I just wondered, have you, um, some of the residents who have contacted us have said something about having the, the more trees by the, the new fence on the inside. Is that something that you had been thinking about? I hadn't thought about it at all until about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> it was news to me, but uh, there's no space there. There's uh -huh. not enough room. So if you do plant more trees, It'd have to be on the interior of the road, and we have uh, we have issues. There are records are poor, and some places non-existent, and there are places where monuments have not been erected for burials, oh. and uh, there are are over a hundred unmarked graves in the cemetery. And we have to be very careful not to uh, dig in the wrong place. So, so that's the other issue about the trees. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? No, I think you've presented it quite clearly and colorfully. Thank you. Yes. Any other members of the public want to uh, comment? Yes. My name is Ed O'Neill. I'm a trustee, a volunteer, and the chief caretaker of the cemetery for the, about the last 15 years. And the tree guy. Yeah, if you could just move that microphone over towards you a little bit. And the tree guy. I, I, there's some trees I don't like because they're messy and requires a lot of maintenance to keep them. Like, and I'm kind of a neat freak up there, so I keep every leaf under control and the weeds under control. And uh, I love my job and I'm just a volunteer as a trustee also. So I love that little spot in my heart because it's peace and quiet and I escape the world for a few hours each day and it's, it's been a real joy for me. And I'm a cemetery person anyway. If there's a little vacation trip somewhere, we always have to find the local cemetery to just drive around and so forth. And I enjoy that and it's a great benefit for people that come. I'm up there pretty much almost daily and uh, so when we have guests that come through the cemetery, it's always a pleasure to re greet them warmly and uh, give them any information that I can. Sometimes we have folks that are searching for family members, and that's a pretty difficult thing because a lot of these folks <coughs> go way, way back. And so uh, 
And the other thing that's now is one of the requirements when you are buried there is that you're re required to have a headstone put in. So that's kind of dressing up the cemetery now like it's a little bit of active because many of the uh, stonework and so forth is uh, falling apart because of age and so forth. So uh, we're grateful for this wonderful opportunity for the town if that works in our arrangements and your arrangements to have this fence. I, I feel myself it's a, a, a benefit to it that makes it look like a cemetery and uh, we'll have to wait and see what the other board members say and we're willing to work anything we can. So we appreciate your interest in our little plot of land up there and it's the last little plot left that's uh, old and uh, we have a beautiful view of the surrounding properties there. And cows on the side of the hill, I mean where could you get a job like I have and have that <laughs> peace and quiet every day. It's, <coughs> it's a wonderful experience. I don't uh, hesitate one minute. So thank you. Appreciate thank you very time. much. Okay. Anyone else like to comment? Okay, seeing no one else come forward, or would you like to? Please. Okay, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the Council. I'm Ellie Aguayo, and uh, today I'm here as Ray's daughter, that's the Ray's Custom Iron Works owner, and also as a current Leadership Napa Valley student. And as part of the design concept, I'm creator and researcher of historical materials for the pieces uh, that will um, make up the fence. So just a little brief history of Ray's Custom Ironworks. Um, we're located at 355 Lafata in St. Helena. That's been there for nearly 20 years now. And we've done work all around the valley, residences, businesses, mainly restaurants and wineries. And um, we have enough experience to carry on this project. This project is about 335 feet long, and we've worked on a project similar length, 350 feet worth of fencing at Trinchero Vineyards. And so today, I just wanted to say that as a leadership Napa Valley um, student and worker with my dad, I believe in maintaining all of Napa Valley beautiful and just contributing, making it better. And I think that this is a really exciting project for us. My dad pays very close attention to detail, as I do. And um, some of the work we've done that you can maybe just remember or see is the, uh, the reconstruction of Basalt Restaurant in Napa, all of the outdoor seating. And as well as inside in Yachtville, we've done um, Redwood Pizzeria. And um, yeah, thank you for your time. I'm going to pass it on down to my dad now if you have any questions. Thank okay, you. thank you. <coughs> Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Ray Aguayo. I'm the owner of Ray's Custom Iron Works. I've been building for like 20 years here. Besides that, I used to be winemaker assistant there for Camus Vineyards, huh? from winemaker assistant to Walden. But anyways, I've been here on the valley, came from St. Louis, Missouri and I've been here on the valley since 1983. And now I have a chance to build these beautiful gates and fence. I've been working with Joe, I've been working with Liz, and between us, you know, we're building something beautiful, kind of like a sample, but beautiful. And I'm gonna put up more effort once I get the job. If I get the job, I'm gonna create more beauty for this place because when I leave, or when I, whenever I retire, I want to come by and say, there was a prior to Liz, Joe, it's been really helpful, my daughter, and including myself. And uh, so I got to say, good luck to you guys, and keep this town beautiful, the way it is, even better. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Seeing no one else, continue discussion by the council, or I'll entertain a motion if someone is ready for that. Well, I do have Vice a Mayor? yes a, about the um, additional twenty five hundred dollars. <throat> I'd be happy to. I have a small town manager contingency, and I'd be very happy to make that all a reality. Okay, I'm glad. So, so you're proposing that we just modify the the request right. to thirty two well, five hundred. If you're interested in thirty two. 
32500 I'll bring back a resolution next council meeting reallocating the 30000 from the prior project and allocating 2500 from the town manager's contingency. Well, the trees were brought up. I just want to make a comment that I don't I don't think it's our pla my place as a council member to ask them to do trees. Um, we're talking about a fence here. I think what they're doing is amazing. Um, so I don't think that's my place to even add that to this. So I want to make that clear. <coughs> Councilmember Mueller? You know, you can't have a discussion without me chiming in on the history <laughs> of this Pioneer Cemetery. It's just... Uh, so amazing just to have that and, and the history. I think just being in Yonville, we should really be so proud of the people who really started the Napa Valley are there. It's not just Yonville, it's this whole valley that was started right here. So um, I certainly want to give my support for this and my interest really kind of moves in the direction more towards passion. So. Um, my motivations are intrinsic and I give you my full support for that I'll just quickly comment I, I sense uh, a positive message that's going to be coming from this council but uh, before we uh, take a formal motion and a vote I do want to recognize there are more people than just you that have dedicated many many hours and years of the, your commitment all of your commitment to the Pioneer Cemetery that is such a great representation for all of Yountville so thank you for that uh, I'm gonna find this is one of the one of the easier decisions to make to uh, provide support and I, I therefore in order to not make this uh, any more belabored than it already has been is there a motion to be had I'm sure there is, is it j we just need to give you direction to do it yeah. to move can it. we allocate 30 and you can just use your discretion for the additional okay so you just okay, okay I, have, I have the motion button okay so, so I'd like to make a motion that we bring uh, ask staff to bring back a resolution at our next uh, council meeting or um, maybe we don't really have to I won't make it a time certain but hopefully within let's next do our next council meeting it will yes. be our next one okay okay great uh, and uh, for approval of our contribution to the fence in the amount of 30 thousand two hundred thirty two thousand five hundred okay and I second so was that Michelle that was clear yes. okay and we have our buttons to push so please do so and that's unanimously approved so thank you all very much it's, it's really going to be a great project and we look forward to seeing your craftsmanship at work also to help us beautify the north end of our town and our our jewel of the pioneer cemetery so <coughs> thank you all very much So we're going to move on to staff informational reports. We have one on the Local Agency Formation Commission of Napa County. You might either speak up really loudly, Sandra, or right. we can move slowly, or both. both. Tonight, I'd like to share with you an update on the LAFCO-initiated Municipal Service Review and Sphere of Influence update for the town and it's important to note that this is a LAFCO initiated action and they had hired a consultant to conduct this review and write the report. The report was presented at a discussion item at LAF the LAFCO Commission's last meeting in February and the Commission gave feedback to LAFCO staff to um, um, bring map, map exhibits and other information back when the item is heard at a public hearing that is um, anticipated to be scheduled for April 3rd. And that, um, that date is approaching. That will be a public hearing, like I say. Staff will be um, attending that meeting to share um, staff and city town comment. And the public was welcome to attend as well. It's the opportunity to comment on um, LAFCO's document and LAFCO's document for the town. Okay. Where will it be? I anticipate that it will be down in at the um, Napa County Board of Supervisors chambers, but it, they have not announced the meeting yet, um, or they haven't published the agenda. The last meeting was actually held here in the Yampa chambers. They, yeah, they have been rotating locations, but home base is typically down at the soups. So I chambers. thought 
It is the third, not the sixth. I have it down for the third also. It's, it's the first Monday of um, the month, so the They third. went back and forth about... Uh, okay, so it is, okay, so it is the third. We'll confirm, but that's what we currently understand, and it will most likely be a 2 o'clock start, which is their normal start time. There was, there was some question about uh, commissioner availability, and I think they were talking about the 6th and went back to the 3rd, but we'll, we'll definitely confirm that. Any other questions of the update? Thank you. The next update is about Envision Yonville. Great. So I'd like to share with you an update on our Envision Yonville, the process that we are going through. And the first update is on the speaker series. And as you know, this is a five-part series that we launched last month. And we've had two of the speaker events. And both have been well, att well attended and well received. The third event occurs this Thursday. And we'll have uh, local residents on that panel and local um, business members as well to discuss the, the balance between the mis business community and residents. So um, we are continuing with that speaker series. Um, the community advisory group applications were first made available last week on Wednesday. And I have copies here if you'd like to see the application. I can pass it around. Um, the applications are available at the Envision Yontville webpage, as well as hard copies at the counter. And um, the application seeks to um, get a, a lot of demographic information about the applicants so that we can get a very diverse group um, to sit as the committee. And we are seeking, hopefully, between 9 and 15 applicants. We'll know more as we receive applications. Um, applications must be received by April 14th, and that's the, um, there are two more speaker series um, before that day, and it's actually the day after the April 13th one, and this will give interested individuals a chance to attend those next two meetings, and then that's just about a month away. Um, so an item that we're seeking your feedback on is with the selection of the community advisory group members, and um, the application, as I mentioned, has been available for less than a week and we've received 10 applications to date and with another month um, available for those applications to come in we believe we'll um, receive somewhere between 20 and 40 applications or at least that's a, a reasonable estimate um, and those um, and select the members selected will um, or from those 40 20 to 40 will select <coughs> 9 to 15 to to sit on this committee um, and I know typically the council has interviewed each member that sits on a committee. Um, however, logistically speaking, um, scheduling those meetings with each of the, um, the applicants and the council and presuming a 15-minute interview time, um, that quite could be quite burdensome on the council. So staff is suggesting that we do um, an initial um, review of the applications and share those with the general plan advisory um, ad hoc committee, and that's made up of Mayor Dunbar and member Moeller and then of the ZDRB members it's chair cook and member um, Denton and we hope that we would be able to recommend um, a cross-section um, of the community based on on the application um, although the ad hoc committee would have all applications and would have a chance to um, review those and, <coughs> and make modifications the question really for the council is whether the council is comfortable in having the ad hoc committee um, interview and appoint those members or whether um, you would like to see a recommendation come to the council um, realizing um, how difficult it may be to um, to schedule all those interviews and so it's thrown out there as an item for all of your feedback so that we can um, bring back um, a better policy for you moving forward or at least establish that type of structure and the, the ad hoc subcommittee supported the idea of being the initial vetting process uh, and it kind of depends on how many applications do come in mm -hmm. and how how diverse the demographics are of those applications because age uh, location in town uh, a lot of different factors as you see in that uh, application will be considered and so we recognize that it could be significant if even if we had 20 applications to have 20 interviews is not terribly realistic frankly so um, we supported the idea 
of taking that on, that, that at least that initial first wave of, of uh, interviews and considerations, and then having the council make an ultimate decision. Any, I don't know if Councilmember Moeller is on that uh, ad hoc committee with me. Any other thoughts? Well, I think the consensus um, <coughs> with at the last committee me me meeting it was that we really all wanted to have a pr very broad range of people that were on this uh, perhaps you know ideally we would have you know somebody who's been here a long time that understands the community maybe even a second homeowner you don't have to have a voter requirement that's just moved in <coughs> to here you know they've moved here for this reason and what are they like or maybe you know somebody who's renting uh, and so that would be our goal I think in reviewing these applications is to really try to get it as broadly grouped as we can so that would be uh, the criteria that we'd be using to select people yeah did you uh, go ahead Councilor. thank you would the um, meetings of the ad hoc committee be open they have not um, they're not public meetings the whole point of the two by twos is that it not need to fall under the same brown act brown act i'm not consider. necessarily saying open as a brown act meeting i'm saying would it be an open discussion that the public could come and sit through well i know what or, i would or say can about that, that even happen i think that's it's kind of an unrealistic expectation to include an infinite number potentially of people if you include them then what is the structure of the evaluation if you I mean the, why is there a, an ad hoc committee in the first place kind of thing so I would hesitate to consider that but I welcome well yeah I think you know, the, the real goal of this advisory group is um, that they, they will be attending a lot of the, the they hopefully will have seen or be able to see most of the uh, the speaker series they're going to be very uh, much involved in, in all the workshops and other stakeholders meetings we have and really kind of bring uh, instead of everybody in, um, bringing together all these thoughts they will help coalesce the thoughts uh, from all the public together with the staff that we've hired so that's really their role and it's really going to be um, kind of the the generalized voice of the public but it will they, they won't really have we're gonna have the final decision um, or approval I would say for for the general plan so they're not really going to be approving the general plan but again it's a much like all of our other advisory um, bodies that are going to be um, that, that we use for many other things yeah I think that uh we talked a little bit about staff presented at the last meeting uh, the importance of, of putting filling the categories that we have already evaluated as being important to us in terms of the demographic uh, of the of the committee the ultimate committee I, I think that it would take those of us that are fully experienced and kind of um, engaged at a professional level to best evaluate who can then come in and support us in, a, in, in an advisory capacity to open it up to um, folks that may have specific individual personal opinions and agendas then make that process more difficult no, I, I don't think I made myself clear sorry I'm saying would it be possible to have the public attend for purposes of observation and hearing the discussions attend the ad hoc committee meetings I'm not saying having the public participate in voting on the on the citizens advisory committee I'm just looking at the transparency of the process because if 40 or 50 applications come in and 15 applications come out to the council I'm trying to find a way to involve the public in knowing who applied what was the thought process can, yes Councilmember Jerome up until yesterday I would com I completely understand what you said but I had a conversation yesterday that 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 just surprised me and now I understand councilmember Dorman's position 
I had someone tell me they'd, why, weren't, why wasn't transportation figured out at the last meeting? I said, well, that's not the process. Well, why is it taking a year and a half? So we went down the timeline again. I think, <clears throat> I don't know how else to say it. I don't understand the confusion on those who, uh, some people are showing up to the meetings for the first time, thankfully, and that's great. But also at the same time, we're starting at a different position than those of us who have been participating for a while, both um, council staff or, or the public. And I, I, there's still misunderstanding on Envision, excuse me, <coughs> on Envision Yonville, not, not by the fault of anybody here, it's just simply the way it's played out. Now that's not our responsibility to go knock on every single door and I completely understand that. But I understand where Councilmember Dorman is coming on this because we still have, figure out how to say this nicely, we, we still have. Confusion. Yes, and, and those who will, who will say I wasn't chosen for this reason and, and, and not work on it. So I understand where she's coming from because there's still confusion <coughs> A, a couple of things, if I, I could. I Hold think. On a second, Steve. Vice Mayor. Well, I wanted to add that if there are, if we are looking for a group of 15 to be that advisory committee, then once we start having the advisory committee meetings and um, working toward the. Uh, update of the general plan those meetings will be open to the public is that not correct correct that's actually a, a great segue because I was about to explain the the process mm -hmm. the there will be a number of topic workshops where the community will be invited and there'll be a discussion so at that particular discussion you will go on a theme and it could be the mobility theme which is then we go through and it's going to be a very interactive discussion so the speaker series is information and setting the stage, not action. People need to be educated about what a general plan is and what's required. <clears throat> so we're taking notes, we're looking at it. The next phase, the um, citizen advisory committee, our group will be that conduit, but we're, we're talking about multiple workshops on topics interactive round tables people will be interacting they'll be communicated outreach the the mailing list all the people that are coming hopefully will continue to come and what they will find is those future workshops are going to be what, where some want to go to right now you know some want to start talking about what are we going to do what are we changing what do we want that part's going to come that will start in the summer once we get the the committee established and the workbooks established um, are and available. So I do think that some people are expecting action and that's forthcoming. And that's why we tried to say that it's a speaker series, it's information setting stage, getting people's appetite um, ready. I don't know, Sandra, if you well, want to add I, on. I just don't think it, it, it handles or answers Councilmember Dorman's question is, should the interview process be public so people can observe the interview process? I think it becomes burdensome to do that, but that's, that's the question. You want the members of the public that want to sit through 20 to 40 interviews or considerations of applications to be in the room. That's what I'm hearing you say. I want them to have that opportunity. And I, I what also- What would the benefit of that be? I think it's transparency. We talk a lot about being transparent, I think, this is going to be a group that hangs together for 18 months and has a big hand in helping to determine the future of our town. I think it would be a good situation for our residents to be able to see that happening. And Sandra, Steve asked you to follow up. Was there something you oh. wanted to add? Well, I was specifically going to go off of some of the confusion that may be arising from the speaker series meetings, and we've heard similar feedback. So we've structured the next meeting so that it's clear what the goal of the meeting is from the start and what we're here to do and what we're not here to do, and hopefully that will help um, the public understand the process more. We're also going to share our um, where we're at in the schedule so that people understand what we're doing now, what's coming. Um, and new steps are being introduced as we move forward and right now it's the, the application and, and the soon to be appointed committee so 
we have heard and we understand we need to make those separate elements a little clearer to people. Well, but before, we, just hold on a sec. Gary, is there any privacy issue with having you know, people provide applications for this kind of an advisory and then their information being shared publicly like that? So yes, the application material itself, I think, you know, addresses any kind of financial information uh, that might be included on there, not that that's being requested. But yeah, personal data like that, yes, under the Public Records Act can be redacted before it's removed. So to the extent the materials are distributed, it would be similar to when those applications are included in an agenda packet when you do the formal interviews here. There's certain things that are blacked out, and that's reviewed by um, the town clerk and also by myself sometimes to make sure that there is no privacy being violated. So yes, things can be redacted and are, are frequently redacted. Yeah. And that basically would be a, a, a public document at that point, could be. Could be. Right, okay. it, well, I was going to say, it does become a public document and if it's, so I think the council needs to think about a couple things. One, uh, if you want to carve out a couple of days for your interviews, you can do that. We'll support that. All of your applications could be put online so that everybody knows who's applied. Now, some of those folks may not be interested in that, but if you're talking about transparency, then that's the consequence because in order for somebody to know who was being considered, you have to have been um, known, so to speak. So I'm just saying that's why staff's here with you because there isn't an easy solution and it's a little more complex than the typical recruitment. Um, but I do think if, if you're interested in transparency, one particular aspect of that would be that we redact, redact everything and put all of the applications that were evaluated either by the ad hoc committee and then brought on to the council um, for consideration. I know one aspect is we still don't know if we're going to receive 40 or more. We're very encouraged by the early interest um, which makes us think that we could be receiving a very large number and then obviously when you have a large number you're also going to have a large number of folks that were disappointed because they didn't get selected for the advisory committee and I think it's really important that the community members and the council stress to them that that doesn't mean we don't want you involved it's just that that body has to be small from a management standpoint to work um, but all of the workshops we want people to come to so it's it's an interesting point and there's um, you know we're here to try to work with whatever the council's preferred policy approach towards screening and selecting the committee members will be yeah. vice mayor thank you well I'm looking at it from for a moment from the position of someone who might be interviewing to you know just a somebody in the neighborhood who has put in an application and I I think they may feel very inhibited if they come and there are you know the, the whole town is there for their interview I don't know but nonetheless however we determine to do that I agree that with as much transparency as we can um, absolutely and then I would appreciate it if the ad hoc committee would you know if we are to end up with 15 members of that committee and we start with 40 I'd really prefer that the ad hoc committee whittle the number down rather than um, bring the the council in on interviewing 40 people Councilmember Muller um, I guess um, I think there might be a little bit of misconception about this advisory committee uh, maybe having more weight than perhaps the the general public and all these workshops and the final conclusions we kind of get to that it's kind of more of a, a steering committee than an advisory committee uh, so I think that's um, might be a little bit of that and just on to change the topic for two quick points it's much like we just had our strategic plan that was very open we had chairs set up all that you know we had one person there for a short amount of time. Um, also, we interview people for Parks and Rec and the Art Commission and all of that, and we've been doing that for years, and 
we don't close the doors to anybody. We kind of even tell the other applicants they can come in or, you know, if they like just out of respect, they could not come in. So there isn't an overwhelming amount of people that really want to come in on these these interviews. So I really don't see that there's, uh, in just my opinion, such demand that we really open something up. <coughs> that uh, and I uh, agree that I think we might actually lose some good applicants. You know, who might feel a little intimidated during the um, interview process. And just to make uh, one other point, because I think we brought up in our last ad hoc that we are going to try to do a better job of a timeline. Here you are now. Here's the third speaker series. We're going to have all these things. You're, you're here and you've got a long ways to go and say it over and over and over again. And another point to bring up, at the same time we are doing our strategic plan. We have people out there, and this is where I've heard most of my comments, Envision Yonville, strategic plan, I'm supposed to come on the 6th and the 7th, what do I do for the strategic plan comments there. Then you guys are going to come back on the April 17th and the 18th. How does this, you know, interact with the Envision Yonfill? We really have to be able to tease those two important things that we're doing apart and they just happen to be coinciding together and let people do a much better job of letting people know Envision Yonfill is about the general plan. It's a very long process and we're going to tell you at each speaker series and every time we get together and the strategic plan I'm not sure how we're going to try to really communicate that better but we do want people we do want to be transparent but I think we are uh, creating a little bit of confusion uh, amongst our people we know what this is all about but I don't really know that they are so um, what I also would like some clarity I'm not sure if we've discussed is if we pick these 9 to 15 people um, to bring is this do, does the council want to interview those finalists well, or where before are we, we get are before there? we go there I want to get back to this whole selection process and transparency um, issue because I'm looking at the application the, the wording of the application is this group would meet four to six times to discuss proposed policies as part of the general plan update as I understand it we're talking about wanting to select a very broad cross-section demographically of our community to represent it as, as balanced as possible to help vet the topics that will then be presented to the entire public. So they're not making decisions that, that the way I heard you describe it, we have this small group of people making decisions that we all have to live with for the, the next 20 years. They are helping craft the conversations that the whole town is going to be engaged in. Uh, having a process that um, I mean to view the process just for the sake of transparency I don't know that I see the value there I don't but then that's probably me thinking we're not hiding anything um, we are a very transparent organization and individuals and so I'm not sure what somebody is suspicious about that they need to see live when it comes to evaluating these applications it's it's a difficult thing to be comparing friends and neighbors and people in town and say we would recommend this person over that person and have people that know each of those people sitting in the audience adding uh, additional uh, pressure to that decision you know I don't frankly look forward to having that additional uh, element in the initial vetting of of applications um, that's kind of my first response to to your comment but I don't know if you wanted to continue no, I, to discuss. I, I mean, I think um, your quote, craft the conversations that the whole town is going to be engaged in. I understand an advisory committee, a steering committee, uh, and I hear Council Member Moeller. I guess my bottom line question is why are we breaking with the tradition of the council? I mean, I get some of it, I get, although I'm willing to interview any person who would come forward for this important work. And I think everybody up here is too. It's just the logistics of it. So to me, the next best thing is to allow our typical process to proceed in which interviews are open to the public. As a ZDRB, the Parks and Rec, you file your application, it goes online, it becomes a public document, people can come and sit out in the audience and hear the interview. To me, we are breaking with that, with that 
tradition and that transparency and because this is a steering committee who will craft the conversations I'm not saying they're the decision makers but I'm saying that they have an important leadership role and it's not accurate that I can uh, recall that it's tradition that we always have the public at all of our meetings to make decisions we've hired the town manager in a process that included vetting candidates and then having public engagement in the final decision making process for example that has happened so it to say we're breaking tradition of having the town uh, residents in all phases of all decisions I don't agree with whether it's appropriate that we do it in this case is what we're still talking about that's more Durham any additional thoughts oh two things transparency is a two-way street if you're gonna if you expect me to be transparent and involved and open if you're gonna s apply for something that we're saying is this important to the community why wouldn't what you say on your application be available to anybody who's going to see why you're a part of this process so I think transparency is a two-way street and unfortunately if it stops people from participating what's their issue from for not participating so that's my first thing secondly I, I've got to <clears throat> I, I, I understand the time the logistics all those things and the way we've done it in the past but given the amount of time and the energy and the money that we're gonna spend on Envision and given the feedback that I've gotten in such a short amount of time even though I think the town's done a great job I, I still I still because of the conversation just in the last week I I, I, I tend to agree with Councilmember Dorman that I, I, I if, if if we're going to involve these people in advisory roles and helping craft a way to go then let's keep it open let's have a discussion let's tell people let's have people be how valuable it is to be on on this and if 40 people want to be on it that's amazing that's great now let's choose the best ones and have it be a public a public open thing so that's my thought Vice Mayor additional thoughts well <clears throat> council member Dorham and council member Dorman Durham and Dorman have <laughs> persuaded me I think that's you know even though it is more of a time commitment for all of us I don't mind it is a very important project I mean one of the most important and there's an, a lot of interest if we get 40 candidates will we may be I may be cursing our good fortune but I think that I agree that if that's the case then um, bring them all in sit them down we'll talk to them one at a time and that's fine well, I think Councilmember Moeller and I already had committed to that since we were, were on the right. yeah, so. committee. So we were, I mean, this is more of a practical um, issue, but if the council deems it worthy and we're now committing our staff time to however many interviews that we're going to do, um, then that's the direction we're going to go. I Will just realized the, realize the realistic uh, time commitment you're asking of all of our staff as well. It is a big deal. I mean, this is another example of why general plan updates aren't done for 20 years. Um, so, well, I just, I'll just, sorry, I'll I, just make. You, hold on, just a second, Vice Mayor. You were just saying something. Um, just that, you know, I, I think that it, because it is the general plan, such an important document that it's worthy of um, our time. Okay. Well, that was one of the first assumptions we made that kind of led us to this was that because of the logistics it was and how many people could apply because I think we used the number 30 or 40 that we didn't really think logistically that the council would want to have public open meetings and <coughs> interview that many. So if we were wrong in that assumption, I think we've heard that here. But I think we also need to really understand much like when we have somebody come in, interview for the ZDRB, uh, it's an open meeting anybody can come but we do you know 
let the applicant know that you know out of respect it might they can either come there or sit in the hall so I think we need to make that decision too if we let's just say we have 40 applicants and they're all sitting in the room is it really fair to you know two or three that make a really good you know pitch that everyone else hears it or do we ask them you can either stay here or sit out you know in the hall or are we only going to allow people who don't have applications I think if we're going to go to this which I'm fine I think we need to work out those details too well, I think there's it would be a distinct advantage to later interviewer interviewees nice. to hear the questions the dialogue and and so if we're if we're getting to that point of this conversation which I'm not sure we are um, absolutely I think in fairness to all the applicants the other applicants would not be in the room during the interviews the general public if we're talking that way could be in the room so vice mayor you had something else well, I, I respectfully disagree. I think that if this is an open process, then everyone will, could have the option. They could either sit outside out of respect or they could come in. We give that uh, option to other candidates for other um, for commissions and boards. So, But um, I just... This is, you know, everything is more complicated than it seems. But I think that um, the 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 real overwhelming um, thing to me is that this is really important and this level of engagement by the community. On the other hand, I think it's really important that we let everyone know that the criteria by which we are um, judging them is based on a large you know a, a diversion not not everybody can be 65 plus not everybody can be uh, as you said uh, council member Moeller uh, you know having lived here forever some new people so we want a, 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 the full spectrum of and we should make that very clear from the very get-go so that people don't say oh well I'm much you know I've lived here longer than that person so that people understand that we're not just looking for people who have lived here for a long time does that work well so let me ask sandra how much direction were you even asking for tonight you gave us a form uh, just to show us <laughs> that you were sending this out and that we've had 10 applications already so we've been talking for a, an extended time about whether we're going to let the public in on the interviews we haven't even talked as an ad hoc committee whether we were going to interview every single application so uh are you looking for that level of detail right I now? Don't, I don't think we're looking for an answer tonight, but we do want to have received the input we did tonight so that we can start thinking more how we'll form this process. And the level of interest that I'm hearing from all of you of being engaged in this process um, will definitely help shape how we move forward. But you're correct. We don't know how many applications we have. Um, we're still we're still exploring um, options and sort of fact finding right now. I think until we really know how many people we're talking about needing to be vetted, this conversation is a little premature, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, if it's 12 people, you have 10, we get two more, then it's not as burdensome on all parties involved. If we get 60, then it's a different issue, mm -hmm. and we may still go the same direction. But it's then we know what we're getting into. Yeah, we'll receive your comment tonight. I think after. April 14th we'll know more and we'll pick this up again for discussion okay okay that went longer than you anticipated I bet <laughs> any other staff informational reports okay uh, oh not a report just a comment uh, there's some staff reports at that point uh, to council meeting reports uh, there has not been a flood control meeting since our last meeting Napa Valley Transportation Authority uh, Councilmember Dorman and I attended the uh, NVTA board retreat out at Mount LaSalle Conference Center discussing transportation solutions for the Napa Valley the main focus uh, of the full day was tra traffic congestion in the south part of the county uh, especially along the highway 29 corridor in American Canyon and the option preferred by American Canyon leaders 
is uh, to widen the highway. However, there is a concern expressed that there are uh, insufficient fund funding sources for expansion projects and that likely we would have to generate a sub substantial amount of money uh, from Napa County alone to afford any type of expansion project. So other solutions like um, staggering traffic signals and providing priority to bus service uh, were also discussed. And uh, some of the board members shared their experiences riding uh, public transit. And so they were, they were offering their, their experiences. I don't know if uh, Council Member Dorman wants to add anything else. We got a couple of really good articles in the paper and the mayor had a good quote. <laughs> you never know what's gonna get quoted, do you? <laughs> Um, Upper Valley Waste Management Authority, is there a report? Uh, no, we didn't meet yesterday due to lack of business. Okay. Uh, I have a few other uh, reports and announcements. Uh, I have been asked to testify before the Governor's Advisory Little Hoover Commission uh, at the State Capitol on June 22nd as they continue to discuss their um, evaluation of the California Veterans Home here in Yonville. They've been discussing all of the uh, eight homes, but in particular, they're looking at um, facility upgrades uh, and service delivery models for the future <coughs> of the Veterans Home. And so I will be attending that meeting. I attended this morning the Board of Supervisors meeting with all of the other mayors uh, to join Supervisor Pedroza in uh, presenting the immigration proclamation that uh, I read earlier this evening in our meeting. Also, I wanted to recognize uh, the significant amount of staff time and effort that went into a successful Yountville Live and Taste of Yountville weekend. Also, the time and effort that um, Whitney Diver McAvoy, our chamber president and CEO, put in. In particular, town manager Steve Rogers and Whitney um, for the last year uh, working closely with our event producers, and I believe that was very well received four days. And one of the other benefits of that event was uh, during two live auctions and a couple of the events, they raised uh, $16,000 to support the Pathway Home. So that was a very nice um, bonus. The subcommittee that is in discussions with the Unified School District staff about Yonville Elementary School uh, it continues to meet. We have a sub subcommittee uh, that is focused on marketing and outreach to <laughs> stakeholders and parents to help try to get the word out about enrolling in Yonville Elementary School. And one of the other topics that was discussed was expanding the preschool offerings that are already on the campus to get more families and for more of the age groups uh, on the campus in um, preschool so they would uh, potentially stay at Yountville uh, and enroll when they're ready for kindergarten. I know Samantha has been on many of these meetings with me. Is there anything else that you want to add? You want to bring up, uh, since I didn't give you a chance during staff reports about red and white? Oh, sure. So the Red and White Affair, which is the Yonville Elementary School's largest fundraiser, is this coming Saturday. Um, tickets are still on sale through midnight tomorrow night. I encourage you all to come. It's going to be a fabulous party where everyone is encouraged to bid often and bid high. Um, as uh, this is something that funds anything that's not a teacher's salary or a building, um, the Red and White Fundraiser really funds everything else. So that includes all the technology, uh, teacher training, um, curriculum, uh, things that you would think the school district typically funds is actually funded here in Yachtville through the PTA's fundraising. Um, and that's because we are not a Title I school here. So the amount of money that we receive, receive for school supplies for kids is a shocking 18 cents per day per child. So this is a really important fundraiser here in Yachtville. That's probably more than you wanted. That's, no, that's, but I've studied this information. <laughs> And also the, uh, the subcommittee was very interested in uh, learning about the Yonville Community Foundation and how it will uh, be a, a supporting foundation to efforts to continue to support the school. Uh, other 
reports and announcements. We'll start over here with Councilmember Muller. Um, I wanted to bring up something that um, got a lot of attention on social media, um, both on Facebook and next door. Yonville was, uh, well, in addition to having a lot of people in town for uh, Yonville Live and Taste of Yonville and a very important wedding, we had the most tremendous amount of smoke covering this valley over the last several days that uh, it is really uh, a concern to lots of people and the one thing that people want to know what they can do the as uh, the Board of Supervisors is having uh, a public-wide uh, meeting with lots of the cities to talk about their strategic plan we talked about that a little bit earlier and there will be in Yonville on April the 3rd from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Yonville Elementary School in the cafeteria. So if you want to talk to the Board of Supervisors who have oversight over a burning out in the in the ag area, they will all be there and uh, come and have your say. I do want to recognize that the county adjusted that meeting schedule when we informed them that they had booked it right on top of our council meeting on the 4th so that that is appreciated uh, let's go uh, any other uh, reports yes, or announcements or oh, I'm going this way come back to you okay that's good yes Dorman. thank you um, I would like to thank Ponches for uh, being in business in our town for 35 years I think their actual anniversary was March 17th and on March 18th I think a bunch of reprobates uh, probably closed them down but uh, thank you, Ponches, and thank you, Solis family. And I just want to reiterate that we will have an Envision Yontville meeting on Thursday at uh, 6 o'clock at the Yontville Community Center. There will be no plush couches, but there will be very comfortable chairs there. Um, and so come talk and hear about the balancing of our community. But will the mirror ball still be hanging up there? No, that's my house. Oh. Vice Thank you. I attended the California Department of Veteran Affairs board meeting, and um, it was held up at the veterans' home. There were lots of veterans there, and there's a lot of concern over two issues, especially the Little Hoover Commission findings, certainly um, domiciliary care um, at the veterans' home. It did help when um, we they were told that the people who live there in in that kind of, you know as a, just having a home there will not be put out that is something that they feared and that they are grandfathered in but that that would be phased out um, and more um, you know, skilled nursing facility care will be introduced up there over the years as it comes up and the other thing is the the dip in the um, MWR fund, um, which is the morale welfare, morale welfare uh, fund, has been dipping because they are accepting uh, more and more veterans who are homeless and have no estate to leave behind um, for that fund after they die. So those are a couple of the issues that are confronting our veterans up at the home. Thank you. And I would reiterate the report that was just recently released by the Little Hoover Commission that is, uh, it's available now. It's, it, I don't know if we have that link or uh, a PDF on our website. We might want to look into doing that. Um, but there is, it's a, it's a substantial report, but there is an executive summary and it addresses fairly specifically some of the ideas they have for Yountville the Yonville campus so that would be uh, a good source of information and that's an ongoing uh, effort by the Commission they have made a report but they have not made their final formal recommendations to the governor yet but af after the meeting that I'm attending on June 22nd that that's when the recommendations are expected to be given so I believe that's our business for this evening uh, one more announcement uh, the Strategic, the community input for the strategic plan is, will occur on um, April the 6th, and the time we have is, that's in the two evening. Two to four or six. Two to, to four, and then four to six, 
same meeting, just making it available for people that might have an evening or an afternoon conference? Well, I have it six to eight, the second one. Correct. Two to four and then six to eight. Correct. So on the same day? I thought the, yes. the yeah. business one was, okay. And the, the business, business one is Friday. Friday from 9. 9? Nine. Nine. Yeah, 9 to 11. Maybe we need to um, run through that one more time. Okay, so April the 6th, we have two strategic plan community meetings. Okay, one from 2 to 4, one from 6 to 8 in the community center. And then the 7th is targeted to our business community but anybody can attend any of those meetings and the one on April 7th is from 9 to 11 in the council chambers thank you very much so that um, that placeholder needs to be corrected then we have a different one from you Steve on that the one I have is 830 to 10 at the community center for that business stakeholders workshop we'll clean everything up okay. and make sure we've got a an invite and a notation, so we'll make sure on that. Vice Mayor, did you have something else? Ah, uh, yes. Um, on um, March 29th, I will be uh, attending the League of California Cities meeting for the um, Community Services Policy Committee in Ontario, California, and um, so I'll be flying down and come back. Okay. Thank you. I believe that takes care of all of our business for tonight. I will entertain a motion to adjourn to our next regular meeting of Tuesday, April 4th at 6 p.m. So moved. I second. All in favor.